Coming into the last leg, but what really impresses me is looking at the audience in the room. Just look around you for a second. We're a house full. And just to shake, thing up, shake things up further, I would request all of you just to stand up for a second. Loosen up a bit. Let's stand up. Yeah, let's get into a, into a zone so that we are a little more. Just stretch yourselves a bit. Don't move your hands too much because the people might be standing around you. So shaking up the industry, we're going to start with cloud kitchens. You can have a seat now. It's okay. Feel comfortable. And uh, let me invite the moderator, Sridhar Prasad, the startup advisor and an investor himself, to come and moderate the session. Sridhar, there you are. Karan Tana, founder and CEO for Ghost Kitchens India. Nicola, co-founder Paris Panini, we were having a good chat just a while ago. Most welcome. Vaishnavi Shukla, who's the legal head at Kitchen Sense. Raghav Joshi, co-founder Rebel. Raghav, where are you? I didn't see you in the morning. You must be around. Shakir Haq, the CEO of NKP Empire Ventures. This looks like a super interesting panel discussion. Sridhar? Let's put all of them in a spot and let's get the best out of them. Uh, they're already on the spot. Fantastic. Okay, I hope you're not missing out on everyone. Great. All the best. Uh, we just have one more session after this, guys. So enjoy the afternoon session. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. All the brand names being represented are known to us, but very different kinds of people are what we have in the menu. To my left, a lawyer representing Kitchen Hat, a Frenchman who ran a food truck and now has built a career in Bangalore selling gourmet uh, sandwiches, one of the oldest in the food business among the startup world, uh, Raghav, and one of the iconic brands of Bangalore, Shakir from Empire. Their perspectives on the new world of uh, Cloud Kitchen is what we'll hear from them. Most of us know are part of the whole ecosystem of being fed by something which is manufactured or cooked at a cloud kitchen. But I think what it drastically changed for all of us is proximity being a priority while choosing food. I like something but it's far away. It's never a thought in our minds, right? And then Gentlemen and ladies like them in Bangalore and rest of the country started building an ecosystem around it. The ecosystem of kitchens. We had brands, we had restaurants, we had restaurants, we had hotels. But kitchen being spoken about, kitchen being invested, kitchen leading to creation of brands. Possibly a five year story or maybe slightly less than that. And that's why literally as, as a compare said, this concept has literally shaken up this world where some of them in the, in, the, in the panel may say, if you have an idea and a brand, come to me, I'll launch you. Because I have the power of the kitchen. That's the topic for today, ladies and gentlemen. And let me open the floor and speak to our esteemed panelists on this new world of cloud kitchens. Maybe over to you, Raghav. What's happening in this world of cloud kitchens? Past two years, I would say specifically past two years, world has opened up, I guess. And you guys are doing platforms, going global, Acquiring brands, uh, before I say anything, Raghav is looking out to acquire brands. Dangerous man on the panel, right? So what are you guys up to? And what do you see from your lens of 10 years with Rebel now, right? From your lens, how is this, the world of kitchens shaping up? Right, thanks Sridhar. Um, and uh, let me actually just step back and talk about our journey to, uh, to help everybody understand you know, how we've sort of evolved. Um, we were earlier just a single brand, customer facing uh, set of um, restaurants uh, by the name of Fasos and that, that ran for about 3-4 um, years starting 2010-11 till 14-15 um, and we expanded in Bombay, Pune, Bangalore uh, but over time we realized that 70-80% of our customers are just ordering online uh, so we thought that you know why basically spend real estate money on uh, front facing locations, uh, road facing locations and so we started experimenting with going on the first floor, going behind the main road, even in the building going on the back side of the building. So 
that essentially worked for us because the rental suddenly came down to below you know 6-7% and uh, then over time we thought that if we have moved FASOS into this model and it's working then why should we restrict ourselves to just a single brand uh, right because customers order from a particular cuisine only at a certain frequency, right? If we've had pizza today, we are unlikely to have pizza tomorrow. Some of us might, but most of us won't have pizza for next 10, 15 days, right? So uh, if we've uh, had pizza today, you know, we would want to have, let's say, biryani after a couple of days or something else. So in that sense, food is somewhat like a movie business is what we realized. You like the movie theater, but you will go to the movie theater only when the movie changes, right? So that's where we thought that why not add more brands into the same kitchen? And hence, we moved from uh, a customer-facing setup to a cloud setup and then a multi-brand cloud setup. And that's, that was our journey from 2014-15 when we first opened the, uh, the kitchen till 2019. And over time, once we had brands like Behru's Biryani, Avan Story and many other, we, we thought that why should we even work on developing brands of our own when there are entrepreneurs who've been passionate about a particular cuisine and have built great brands and just want to scale up across the country. And that's where we pivoted towards becoming a platform. So since 2019, we've not opened more brands. We've just focused on expanding in the kitchen model. Now we have 350 kitchens in India, about 15, 20 in uh, the Middle East, about 40 in Indonesia, about a couple of them in the UK, and planning to expand globally as much as possible. And inviting entrepreneurs who've built good brands in specific cuisines in specific cities. It could be just, you know, a couple of locations, restaurants, but you want to go to 200 locations in India. So you can, you can come into the Rebel Launcher program, you know, contact us at, let's say, launcher, the email address is launcher at rebelfoods.com and we'll help you expand across the country. And I think, uh, you know, Kitchens at and some of the others are also, you know, providing different solutions uh, of the same problem of scalability. Uh, it will require de-scaling your, your uh, product to make it scalable. It will require figuring out the supply chain. It will require, you know, some of the other functional aspects. So that's broadly been, you know, our journey. And when a brand is actually looking to scale uh, and is doing well in the launcher program with us in 10, 15, 20 locations, we also then look to invest in that brand. And, uh, you know, that's the journey that we've had with uh, Slay Coffee, Chaitanya, the founder is here. We've been fortunate to work with him with smooth chocolate that we've invested in, Biryani Blues, uh, a biryani brand based out of NCR, uh, Zomos, which is a Momos brand, and looking to, you know, work with more such passionate entrepreneurs. It's dangerous, isn't it? Just like a Chinese company saying, was, I own the supply chain. <laughs> Sorry, on a lighter note. So he mentioned that he likes it to be a multi-movie movie theater, but on both sides of him, there are gentlemen who wants us to watch the same movie. What's your view, Shakir? You've had an iconic brand. Cloud Kitchen has transformed possibly your business as well. You've come closer to us. What's your take on what's happening now? <clears throat> uh, I think uh, for Empire, we had a rough start uh, with the Cloud Kitchens because it was a new business model altogether. And uh, since we were traditional uh, you know, business model running for the past five decades, it was something new that we took some time to adopt. Uh, initially, you know, we couldn't have uh, the right kind of uh, uh, the team in place. What is the correct kind of menu that we need to keep when we are scaling down the level of operations in from a 5,000 square feet to a 250 square feet, uh, you know, a, a counter. So uh, everything is scaled down. So when we were doing larger volumes at our restaurants, doing uh, in a 250 square feet was a challenge. We didn't know how to do this. It took us some time. We incurred a lot of losses in the beginning. Then we went about trying different strategies because, you know, it was in its infancy as a business model as well. And we did not have enough to go out and learn from or look at. So we had to go through that own journey of learning within a cloud kitchen. So it took us about almost a year for us to start getting profitable. Then uh, post-COVID, the turnout has been tremendous. It has been great. We could really optimize our costing really well. Our business model is working really fantastic for us. Within a year, we have seen uh, in a turnover growing at least about 50% year on year in the cloud kitchen itself and profitability is also maxed out. So, you know, that model with aggregators and platforms like a marketplace 
is working really well for, I think, at least to say for established brands. You know, newer brands have challenges for them because the relevance is quite low. People don't know about the brand. They need to be depending on the aggregator to push them by again CPCs and other promotional ads where again it's costing them a lot. So your return on investment may take some time when it's a new brand. Now we have understood the model in the last four years. Now for us to start within the city is quite simple. It's, it's, it's a plug and play model. I just have to arrange six or seven people, put up, send the, uh, the vehicle with all the goods necessary. We can start out within less than 24 hours. But for me, let's say we're going to a different city. Could be challenging. Now I enter as a new brand. So I go through that churn of marketing, waiting, wastage, optimization. So probably though it's going to be a little challenging in the first couple of months, but it's going to be turning out really fruitful in the longer end. So though it's in its infancy, I think, I feel cloud kitchens are going to be a bang going forward. Yes. Thank you. Nicholas, did you face the same kind of challenges? Did you face the same kind of challenges when you go oh, this way? You've got five kitchens in Bangalore? Hello. So I feel that uh, all restaurants are to adapt to this new way of consumption, I mean consuming, because especially after COVID, where like we are to shut kind of all our dining, we are to uh, adapt our model to the online ordering. So we first of all had to make sure that our product is delivery friendly, because Anyway, anything that you have on your menu, you want it to, you want it to move. So um, we had to adapt our model, but uh, there's a large scope of growth for the online because you can cater to definitely more people. When you open a restaurant dining, you have about like, I mean, just talking about uh, my brand, but we have about like 30 seatings while uh, the online ordering is just booming and the orders like keep flowing. So there's more scoop of growth into the um, online ordering. So that's a sector, that's a, a market that we can't ignore right now, definitely. Now coming to, like if you're a newcomer on the market, I would say it's quite difficult to enter the, the online ordering unless you spend quite a bomb because you have to invest in marketing you have, to, you have to get the words known, you have to get your brand known to customers because when you see your Swiggy nowadays, it's, it's uh, so many brands are there. Like, I mean, like you will not even care, like you will not scroll down to, on Swiggy to the, the, the last row, like there are too many brands. So you should focus on definitely your product, make sure that you have strong concept and USP and uh, and that way you can go you can go online but um, yeah people have to adapt people have to get to this uh, new way of consuming and uh, and otherwise yeah it's it's very difficult to to grow your your standalone business question for your take you're on the other side helping these guys with many of these problems what do you guys see as their problems and how are you solving and how is the industry reacting to that? All right. So I'll just give a background about Kitchen Z, what we do at Kitchen Z is. So our founder, Mr. Janez, JK as he's fondly called, he started up Kitchen Z back in 2018. So the entire concept of starting Kitchen Z was that we will be a supply aggregator, we will bridge the gap between the aggregator till the customer and we will solve the problem for the restaurant partner where they do not have to do the run around, run around work for any of the things and we would be helping them out with literally everything, be it the licensing part, be it the contractual part, be it uh, getting things done from the aggregators and everything else. So over the years, we obviously went through different models. We, uh, you know, we have interacted with over 500 brands over the last five years that I am associated with Kitchen Z. So I joined Kitchen Z at when it was its first month, it had just begun. That's when I had joined, uh, right after my college. And I have really seen the struggle of our founder and how we kind of tried solving problems. And the journey from back in 2018 to today where we recently acquired Swiggy Access Kitchens, it has been a tremendous journey. There has been so many learnings. Coming to problems what cloud kitchens might face or so we have a set of both established and non-established brands. Some of them are yet to be established or in the path of being established. So, 
see, the key concept is obviously if you have good food, it sells. But does good food fall uh, the entire part of the pie chart? No. It, good food is 40% and everything else is 60%. This is one of the things I was uh, seeing uh, yesterday in one of uh, you know, the articles that I came across. So yes, good, if you have good food, it does go a long way, but there are obviously challenges. Like I have seen, I personally advised a lot of brands. So what we at Kitchen Z do is we not just help them out with uh, the contractual part, how to get a Kitchen Z plug and play model. And you know, all they have to do is just get their expertise and we will help them out with the rest of the things. So I know that there are a lot of budding brands here who would need a platform like Kitchen Z to uh, help them out, and we are here to help you. You can have any questions that you may have, you can ask me later on. But right from setting it up to advising them on IP, how they can build their brand, to how they can build up multiple brands while operating under the same entity, we help them out literally with everything. So yes, we have seen them facing challenges, of how to go about it, how to connect with a certain aggregator. So initially, like Nicholas also pointed out, that uh, they may have a certain problem with a certain aggregator. But once we step in, they do not have to do any of those works. We do it all for them. So uh, a lot of people, even uh, when Empire had partnered with us, and a lot of other brands also, so initially, like he said, obviously it's difficult for the initial few months. Anybody who is venturing into this space immediately, yes, it's not easy to like, expect a break even for a brand like Empire, obviously like people know the huge name that it is, but for all other brands I'm talking about here now, it's not easy. But we are here to solve the problem and I think with Kitchen Z, Rebel Foods and many other players, I don't think it is going to be as challenging as it was and uh, there are a lot lesser problems now and if there are any, we'd like to hear them out and hopefully solve them as well. Good. Let's talk about biryanis. Let's put them in a spot. All this sounds very nice. I have an idea. There are many people who will help me set up my cloud kitchen. Somebody else will help me uh, go live. Swiggy Zomato, so the world will take them to the masses. Let's talk economics. Okay? So for the benefit of the crowd, how much of you can uh, give as examples? How do we make money? And uh, maybe I'll start with you, Shakir. Uh, or think about the the way economics should be uh, thought in this business. We'll come to money later. I'm not using the jargon of unit economics, but as an entrepreneur, what should be the economic thought when you're getting into the story? And then I'll come to the two uh, aggregator supporter platforms. Let me, let me hear your view and, and yourself, Nicholas. Because if I, if I visualize X number of empire outlets, they also translate later to being kitchens for ordering and then you have Y number of kitchens through them catering to online orders. As the entrepreneur who's running the show, how do you view this from an economics perspective? You really make money? See, if you're talking online, it is a challenge. You know, not us sitting here, but we have aggregators in place. Uh, as they started, I think, five, seven years since they are in the industry and today as an entrepreneur, if I am from the IT background, any other background, I want to pursue my passion for food. You know, I look at passion for food in two ways. Either you want to cook or you want to eat. Which of it is you? So just because you see crowds outside restaurants, you think, ah, it's an easy way to make money. No, it's not. It's a full-time job. The 24 bar 7 full-time job. And if you want to get into the online business, as an entrepreneur, before you get into the economics, you need to have something that can really sell, where people would want to buy it. Now, if you're, if you're looking at biryani, you can get thousands of biryanis. You know, our main product is not a biryani, but yes, it is in the top 10. But at the same time, can anybody guess a great biryani? There are probably great 10, 10 great biryanis. So getting into the economies of a restaurant business whether it be a standalone or a cloud kitchen. You know, it, 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 it's not very complex, but though it looks simple, but getting it right, it's not very easy. Getting your cost from your cost of goods sold to your net profit that you can make from every dish to a, a brand, it's not very simple. You know, in today's world, with the competition, with the costs that you have to incur to sell, 
and if you don't understand the way how your menu pricing works and how a customer is going to perceive it because we are a uh, you know great emotional market indians are very emotional when it comes to their food so it, it, it's quite challenging and uh, you need to do a bit of research uh, before opening up a restaurant or a cloud kitchen you need to be well learned well understood from your costing to your preparation to the technique to everything so economy yes does play a great role and your return on investment your break even points has to be calculated really well if you're not from a financial background you need a lot of help thank you nicholas your views on this i also second that uh, challenging part uh, see first of all you really need to be aware of food costs your operational expenses to set up an online business because see you have aggregators will take a big like a chunks of your profit so you need to be well aware of like the costing of your product how much your packaging will cost like there are a lot of costs that are involved that we probably neglect when we do dining or when we have yeah just a, a dining models so that comes with packaging that comes with uh, uh delivery or uh, delivery costs so you need to really uh dig into uh what expenses you're going through before going online because otherwise and i've seen this uh cloud kitchens running at loss so those guys it's not like they don't have any clue of what is their food cost but it's mostly that they think that okay i have a food cost of uh whatever 20 25 as a dining so my food cost or my expenses will be the same as for my online uh, my online ordering it's not the same at all so like please uh uh yeah dig into your uh your metrics uh see what kind of packaging you're using see what kind of expenses you're running and uh, and take a call because even you might see sometimes people selling at cheap prices online you want to compete with them sometimes it's not about just competing with the prices people are ready to pay when there is an extra value when there is a real taste in the product so like don't even fix your prices uh according to the uh to the competitors or according to the like markets but fix it as like think about your your expenses also and if your product is good at the end of the day customer will will buy from you i would like to add something again uh you want to solve a problem or you're behind valuation that is also a question now when it is in valuation you are raising funds you are not worried about your profit you are only worried about your goal end of 3 years kitna turnover karna hai yeah i'm i'm not in this kind of model like <laughs> i'm all self founded and bootstrap so yes so uh, talking about economy he'll yeah, soon be there and i'll teach him don't yes. worry <laughs> sorry back to that by the way just digressing for the sake of the audience i'm told that egg biryani makes more profits than chicken biryani is that true egg biryani makes more profits than chicken biryani because the price of chicken fluctuates proteins are costly that's the kind of uh, sensitivity on cost which these gentlemen are talking about right back to you raghav so they said their perception on economics now you've built a different business i mean i mean similar some portion of your business is very similar to kitchenette how do you see economics right for the time being let's forget valuations right but do you get satisfied with okay i did 20000 orders today we have progressed x basis points because of xyz do you guys think like that what's your thought on it yeah absolutely um, and you know would be happy to provide the perspective from a kitchen angle as well as a brand angle because we own a lot of brands as well behrus biryani is a you know uh, 400 450 crore uh, annual sales brand now uh, which we've built over the years and it's completely online there are no offline locations um and we've also run kitchens with lot of lot of brands uh, not just rebels own brands but lot of um, you know 3p brands working with us as well um 
absolutely right that you know in a cloud uh, setup the margins are lower than offline and there is no doubt about it and that's because you know there are aggregators there is delivery cost on every order which is not there in a in a fixed cost offline setup right and just to throw numbers um, once you have set up a restaurant every time a customer walks in you don't have to pay 20% 25% commission to the aggregator and the aggregator also is bearing the cost of delivery right so and that delivery cost is anywhere between 50 to 70 rupees so the customer pays a certain amount uh, in delivery uh, 70 rupees goes goes there so if the average order value is anything less than 300 350 rupees then the delivery cost itself is 20% and the aggregator will have to charge you uh, you know for that right Aggregators have started taking money from the customers also, but we are still in early days. If you look at more evolved markets like the West or even Indonesia, where we are, customers are absolutely fine paying 5% of the value as uh, delivery charges. So, you know, customers pay 30, 40 rupees on a 400, 500 rupee order easily. And that's where the cost gets offset. But in India, uh, I think we are still in that journey. So. If you think about a particular restaurant, you know, I would share a couple of these things that, that you can possibly look at. First of all, you know, when you are building a brand, is it uh, going to be in 10 locations or is, are you really thinking about 100, 150, 200 locations? And it can be completely your, you know, decision based on your brand persona, how you are thinking about it, uh, what kind of cuisine is there, is there scalability, inherent scalability in the brand or not? Uh, depending on that, uh, you know, is it dine-in focused or delivery focused and the economics will change massively. In dine-in what will happen is, just taking one example, you will spend about a crore in setting up a dine-in restaurant. You know, it will need to have some interiors, good interiors, right, a kitchen. You will have rent of at least three, three and a half lakhs broadly. What we look at, in fact, we have started opening offline locations of our own, you know, under the, under our D2C brand called each show. So you'll spend uh, a crore and uh, you will definitely see sales coming, you know, from the very beginning, customers walking in and good healthy EBITDA margins at the kitchen level of at least 15, 20, 25 percent, right? So let's say you, you start doing 20 lakhs of sale a month and you will see anywhere between 2 lakhs to 4 lakhs of monthly profit, which would mean that the one crore that you've spent in capex will get recovered in about 25 to 30 months that's broadly where the economics will be but this is assuming that your restaurant takes off well right customers walk in and that the sales that you do in the first month and second one that sort of holds and in fact starts building up a lot of times we've seen our own experience also with fasos that customers come in in offline in the beginning but after some time you know they they start ordering online so you're customer base shifts from uh, offline to online and sort of keeps building up unless you are at places like the airports where there are sort of captive crowds and there the sales just keeps going up with the consumer traffic, uh, you know, going up and assuming the number of locations are the same. So uh, an offline setup will be something like this about, uh, you know, let's say one crore of uh, capex, about 20 lakhs of sale, about three to four lakhs of profit, about 25 to 30 months of break even. An online setup will be very different. The capex will come down to 10 lakhs or if you're, you know, you're working with kitchens at or with rebel foods, probably even lower. And the margins will not be 20%. The margin will probably be maximum 10%. It will be somewhere in five to 10% range because what happens is the aggregator takes away 20 to 25%. That's because there is a delivery cost. Plus uh, there is performance marketing, plus there is discount. In an offline setup, there is no discount. A customer who's walked in will order something. But in online, you know, you, if you have a biryani brand, you are competing with 10 other biryani brands and the customer will choose you depending on, you know, how strong your brand is and how much, you know, offer you're giving at that moment because the customer has 10 choices to make from, right? So um, based on that, your margins will not be as much as offline. It will be somewhere in, you know, let's say you've put 10 lakhs in Capex you will do probably just 10 lakhs of sale instead of, you know, doing 20 lakhs of sale in offline. And on that 10 lakhs, you will probably make only 5% or 10% maximum. So, you know, your margins might be anywhere between 30,000 to 50,000 and the payback might still be 20 months, 30,000 to 50,000 on a capex of 10 lakhs. So the point I'm trying to make is you, you have to think from a payback perspective as well, right? Uh, your payback might be same, uh, and hence the one crore that you might use for putting one offline store might be similar in terms of putting 10 online stores and having the same payback. 
but it really depends on how you think about your brand are you thinking scale or not just to give example of behrus you know the journey was starting with first of all getting the product to a scalability stage where it's doing well in online it's doing well in 30 locations uh, the the biryani is very scalable with with minimal uh, you know skill level required at the kitchen we believe skill and scale are sort of inversely proportional and you know if you are really thinking of putting it in 100 200 300 locations so we first put biryani behrus in one city got it right took it to 350 locations all over the country uh, and then we put brand building money behind it because when you have presence across the country then you can really go after customers uh, through the traditional media routes such as tv such as newspapers and on a per customer acquisition cost basis that's actually the cheapest but you will need an investment of a crore 2 crores 3 crores for running any sort of campaign so for behrus let's say you know it's there in 350 locations around e then around the you know december peak we run campaigns twice twice a year uh, where we have to put several crores behind behind the brand uh, but the number of customers that we acquire and the the customer acquisition cost on a new customer basis is actually the lowest uh, on a on a per customer basis so the journey basically becomes get the product right expand the network and then put money behind marketing for an online route for an offline route you know it's the traditional way you know you start the restaurant people discover there are various ways to market it in that city and uh, you know that's how you you take it up so uh, again smoor chocolates is is a brand that we are you know very proud to have been associated with and invested in and uh, smoor opens stores uh, there are a lot of stores of smoor in bangalore you know they've opened in bombay and pune and they are going through that offline expansion journey with with a cloud supported model so you know you see a smoor store in bandra but you go to andheri and then you can order smoor from there uh, so omni channel is what we've also sort of realized is the is probably the right way forward where you have iconic uh, you have presence in iconic locations in the city uh, and then you have presence through cloud everywhere and when this is there when you are present in 30 35 places in the city you can put money behind marketing and it will give you the best rois to take your brand from you know this level to that level interesting just one key takeaway for me when you said this is in an offline scenario possibly location also dictated on what is the money you make right i mean there are iconic locations in india in london covent garden and in whatever it be but in the online world i think you have said started you said multiple times a product you get the product right possibly then you're not playing a price game if you're a me too biryani you compete with another a small kitchen guy who is selling at 190 bucks isn't it so possibly the level of investment in getting that uniqueness of the product biryani is a biryani is a biryani but you guys i'm surprised to see 500 crore biryani brand made out of nowhere in about 5 years 4 years right yeah uh, 2017 is when we started 17, so 6 right. years so somebody got the product right i think possibly that is what drove everything for you right and and you've got two gome companies here as well so interesting thought let me get to another thread because i've got a lawyer next to me please put your lawyer compliance tough person hat on they all painted initially a rosy picture then raghav gave the picture of real economics what are the challenges in this business what do you see what can go wrong and where do you put your old hat on and and stop those issues okay so there are multiple things that can go wrong from a lawyer's hat perspective so what happens is number 1 food handling if uh, you know you're not training the guys who are handling food or how the packaging needs to be done or on the hygiene standards there is everything that can go wrong if you are not taking your compliances seriously for example your fsci license your sne which is a shops and establishment your trade licenses your gst if you do not take it seriously everything can go wrong because the uh, policing or the checks and measures in this industry which is a completely if we are talking about a complete cloud based kitchen which is a home delivery only model then there is uh, you know a lot of challenges that the brand can face because if there is one complaint which is highlighted then the it can also lead to the brand shutting down and they can you know they must have invested a lot because when we say that with cloud kitchens there is very less operational cost what we also need to think about is that you are investing much more on tech and marketing so there the cost is not eliminated altogether there is definitely a cost involved but in some other aspects so with the lawyer hat on as you said 
So compliances have to be taken very seriously. One more thing that I noticed with brands is that uh, you know, they do not take their IP seriously. Like uh, in the initial stage, they would be like, we are at a very nascent stage, it's not necessary for us to maybe go ahead and register, you know, get a trademark done of our brand. So we do recommend it to them saying that, you know, if we have the vision ahead that yes, our brand is going through such and such scalability and is going to achieve X, Y, Z numbers, then of course, why don't you safeguard it today? What if you have built a brand based on, uh, you know, your hard work, sweat, efforts, money, everything, good food, and then one fine day you lose it all because somebody won the IP, you know, over you. IP on the then, brand name? Yes, or the, or the on the brand name I'm talking about. So, because that is the key, because your brand is known by that name. People are popularly, you know, maybe visiting again and again as in ordering again and again from that space because of the brand that you created. Your brand name is very dear to you and now you lose it all. So, also, you know what, if they say that, you know what, no, that is not the large long-term plan and this is what we are doing just for short term and see how much money we can make. If a brand like this says so, then you can always assign your IP, make money out of that as well. So it's not necessary that because we will not use it on a later stage, it's not necessary for me to do, you know, get the IP done today. So yes, challenges are multiple with regards to food handling, things going wrong, you getting, uh, you know, a compliance officer complaint, just paste it on your door, two IPs to everything else. So yes, with the lawyer's so perspective. Little counterintuitive for me on the first part. The old assumption, 20 years back in India, we started BPOs, we thought standardization brings quality. Right, or centralization with better supervision brings quality. And when we are talking cloud kitchens, there is an assumption as an outsider that the SOPs are stronger, right? There is far more scrutiny and, and there are far more measures and checks because it's run possibly professionally. And still, do you see this as a challenge? Uh, contrary to the popular opinion, it, the scrutiny is not that much because there are thousands and thousands of brands which are just operating maybe out of a home out of a very small space and you know there are like 10 different items coming from the same kitchen you're probably ordering a aloo ka paratha in the morning to a biryani in the afternoon to a pizza in the night probably it's all coming from the same kitchen you don't even know but have because you have never stepped into that kitchen you have been ordering for say two years continuously how do you exactly know how the kitchen is being maintained or how the person handling the food is actually handling it who is keeping those checks and measures? Or if he has all his three licenses, put it up on his uh, you know, wall, up, laminated. How do we know these things? These are some of the assumptions people take. But also we have seen multiple cloud kitchens shutting down because of their you know, lack of uh, you know, food handling standards or FSSCI standards not being followed. So you can lose your license within a day. But yes, that is when we have the aggregators also in the picture who ensure that these checks and measures are in place before onboarding such and such brands. So, you know, it's a necessary evil that we have. Obviously, there also needs to be a lot of things because as I was uh, listening to the panel very carefully, so aggregator, we were dwelling on the aggregator topic quite a bit and uh, how, you know, higher aggregator cost is a problem in Cloud Kitchen while the same is not the case when you're stepping into a restaurant and having a dinner. But we are talking here about a crowd that is uh, for the lack of better word, lazy or maybe doesn't want to cook food and that's why he's ordering in. So he does not want to walk up to a restaurant, right? So obviously there needs to be certain things we can change, like maybe we can incentivize the, uh, you know, revenue sharing system. Somebody, as you are doing larger number of AOVs, you may be uh, paying lesser to the aggregators while you are doing less, when you are doing less number of AOVs, you are paying higher to the aggregators, something like that. Some model can be worked out definitely. This is an ecosystem and where we all are there and I think, uh, you know, we necessarily do not have to eliminate one another to uh, survive. We can all coexist is what I would like to say. I won't kill the topic, I'll just go to them and come back on the initial part of whatever she articulated, whatever Vaishnavi said. Let's talk positive. From your experience, how do we kill this problem for the benefit of the entrepreneurs outside? Starting with you, Nicholas. So, uh Tackling those problems, it's mainly like setting up strong SOP. Your backend needs to be really, uh, really strong in terms of in terms of operations. And uh, yeah, because as uh, as you mentioned, a lot of cloud kitchen are running like out of a, out of a small space. We see also more more and more cloud kitchen uh, growing nowadays because it's less risk. 
It's very easy to open a cloud kitchen. We just need like a, normally a, like a commercial space and a couple of, of kitchen equipments. So like for someone who wants to start a new concept, it's actually quite ideal because it's low risk when you see compared to a, to a dining experience. So like there's also a lot of flexibility in terms of action, in terms of uh, menu items. You want to try out like a new thing, something that has not been started in Bangalore. You want to launch something. You have a lot of flexibility when it comes to cloud kitchens and online ordering. But yeah, like uh, cloud kitchens, especially nowadays, comes and go. And I still, I mean, I believe strongly that like uh, uh, a good product with uh, strong fundamentals, standards also, and SOPs will uh, will uh, uh, live long and uh, will be able to grow because of even in terms of how you advertise your product. Like uh, a person who's uh, advertising about how he makes. Uh, the sauce, how he makes fresh his bread every day, how he makes fresh his, like the whole uh, uh, production line, if he uh, advertise on that, that is a great way to capture customers. That's what actually customers want to see. And like on the online ordering, people are uh, most of the time forgetting about this, but people want to see some life in the kitchen and behind the, bra the brand. So that's where like you will see successful uh, brands where like people will slightly dig into it because see, even for, I'll take a personal example. When I see a new brand online, I like seeing what they're doing. Like not just like, okay, fine. They have a 4.5 on Swiggy, on Zomato. Like, let me see what's behind the brand. He's the chef like from another country. Is the chef like graduated from some fancy uh, institutes. So it's more like, having your life behind the brands. So that's what actually captures the audience and make it like an interesting brand to follow and to be loyal to. So that's why like you're lost between like all those brands that you see on, on Swiggy, on Zomato, online in, in general. But that's how like clearly a brand can stand out and can, uh, can survive in these uh, big games of, uh, of Cloud Kitchen. <clears throat> uh, completely agree with what Vaishnavi, uh, you know, spoke about. Uh, compliances is something we also give paramount importance to. You know, surviving for five and a half decades is not a joke. You know, we've over time built trust with our customers. So, like uh, Nicholas was saying, you know, online people do not know how it's functioning at the back. So, since we are a well-known brand, and post-COVID, we've even taken the initiative of having. TV screens in our restaurants, which shows the live, showcases the live kitchen. So we want to show our customers that we practice what we preach. So when it comes to SOPs, when it comes to compliances, anytime you want to walk into the kitchen, a customer requests, sir, we want to have a tour of your kitchen. We would be more than glad and happy to take them around because I am confident that we are meeting standards because trust is something we have built over time, and to maintain that trust, it's no joke. So compliances, SOPs standards, these are all basic values, basic fundamentals uh, in a way you start a business with because you're serving food, you're playing with emotions. So these are all of paramount importance to, to us at least. Thank you. Let me take a pause here and let's do a quick recap thread. Raghavi you're from Bombay, right? Isn't it? So let's, okay, let's do a role play. I have a biryani brand, Emperor, not Empire. I want to launch in 10 cloud kitchens in Bombay. Please advise me, what are the 10 things I should do? All of you. Right, so, uh, you know, when a brand comes to us, uh, the three or four uh, filters that, you know, we apply, thinking about them from a launcher program perspective are, first of all, how is the customer experience? Even if you are there in two locations, are you rated really well on the aggregators or if you have your own D2C channel? That has to be great. Uh, the economics have to make sense after accounting for uh, the aggregator commission. The scale in terms of uh, you know, revenue per location, that has to be good. And finally, it has to be 
uh, you know, scalable, which means some of the things have to be back-ended, it has to be made relatively skill-free, especially if you're thinking about 100, 200 locations. So, these are the four things. So your third one is revenue per location, isn't it? Revenue per location, customer Just experience. Just pause there, I'll go to uh, Nicholas. Nicholas, somewhere when we were sitting there, you mentioned about going to Electronic City with your Gome sandwich brand. Did you think like this? I mean, I thought of Bombay, but Electronic City is also equally far. Do you think through launching in, in Electronic City, how to make more money from that one cluster? See, uh, for us, we use, I mean, yeah, we use Cloud Kitchen mainly to test out the market. So we launched our first standalone in, in Indranagar. The second was, uh, was a Cloud Kitchen in, in uh, Sanjanagar. And after probably a year, we converted this Cloud Kitchen into a dining outlet. So for us, this Cloud Kitchen model has been working out pretty well because we are able to uh, test out a market, like test out a new area, and from that, uh, convert it to a dining if it makes sense in terms of metrics. Sorry, I paused you. Just go on back. Because right. also one more thing is, again, uh, this, uh, there are some areas where uh, the ROI will be definitely more. Like when you see like your audience uh, in Indranagar is not the same as Electronicity, the purchasing power might be different, like the amount that the people spend in Electronic City might be uh, more or less whatever uh, compared to another area. So that way we are also, I mean, when I say like test out the market, we are able to uh, kind of come to a conclusion after let's say a couple of months, six months, working out with uh, a Cloud Kitchen model. Sorry, I paused you. Right, so you know revenue per location, margins, Customer experience, in fact, these three are relevant for any business, not just in food everywhere, right? It's top line, bottom line, and customer experience, leading to loyalty, etc. And then scalability. These are the four filters that, you know, we apply working, and then, you know, obviously the connect that we have with the founder before we look at expanding the brand through launcher and then finally investing uh, in the brand. So this is what our advice is to, uh, to any, uh, any founder. And from a cloud perspective, as we discussed earlier, it's very important to have your average order value, you know, really go towards 300, 350 bare minimum. Because at 250 rupees with the delivery cost being a specific fixed cost, you know, on a per order basis, it's going to be really, really difficult to make it profitable. Because what will happen is that if your average order value is 250 to 300 rupees, most likely the customer that you have is is also a, you know a price conscious customer no, you know I'm, I'm probably generalizing but that's very likely to be the case and if it's a price conscious customer then keeping your gross margins upwards of 60 65 70 percent you know that becomes a challenge because you know price is, uh, is something that the customer is very conscious of right so you can't increase prices uh, and therefore making margins becomes difficult so from a cloud perspective our advice is Try to see how you can increase the average order value. It could be, you know, how a lot of brands do it through making combos where you have a starter, uh, a dessert, a beverage, along with the main meal and put it as a package. It could be meals for two. It could be some offers. Uh, we have a platform called EatShore on which all the brands which are there in our kitchen, you know, can go together in a single order, which is actually not possible on Swiggy or Zomato. So a, a starter from Behru's, a pizza and a dessert can actually be together in one order. And we've seen that, you know, what this does is, for a brand coming into our kitchen, their starter gets upsold along with a pizza. You know, for 59 rupees, for example, Zomo's, which is a brand that we've invested in uh, for in the Momo's category, uh, a customer buys it along with pizza as a starter. So a Zomo's product is sampled by the customer at a very low price point. So you have to think about ways in which you can increase your average order value. That is going to make your economics work in, in cloud. And apart from that, having at least 65%, 60 to 65% gross margin, which means your food cost cannot go beyond 30, 35%. Uh, that is very important because apart from that, you'll have 20% uh, commission going to aggregators. You will have, uh, you know, at least 10 to 12% fixed cost in terms of manpower. There will be rentals. Even if the rentals are below 7, 8%, utilities, all of that, you know, uh, supply chain cost is going to become difficult. The big ones are this, average order value and your gross margin. So these are things that you have to be very careful of. But uh, you know, just to add one point on what was being discussed earlier, there are a lot of challenges from a compliance perspective, completely agreed. 
but you know being been here in this business for uh, just about 12 13 years at least our experience has been that compliance has actually become better over the years and the ease of doing business we've really felt that ease of doing business has has improved as compared to how uh, you know we felt in 2013 obviously we've grown in in terms of scale but it's much faster to you know open new locations and while there are challenges the good news is that everything is in your hands as an entrepreneur you know if you're doing the right thing if you are taking care of hygiene if you're taking care of your licensing then there is nobody who can stop you from uh, from doing business at least that's what our experience has been and uh, you know india is really a restaurant staffed country just to share this these numbers with you india has 200 restaurants per million people while china has 4000 us has 7000 so you know we are like 10x or uh, or or you know 20x 30x as compared to some of the other markets um, even indonesia you know a developing country like india has about 1500 restaurants per million people so india is really really under penetrated uh, the 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 us has 75 chains with more than 500 locations each think about that 75 individual chains with more than 500 locations each. India has four, right? Uh, China has 30 plus. So <laughs> there is huge demand which will build up in India. There is no doubt about it. Sometimes, uh, you know, brands are not able to scale because the real estate cost in India is amongst the highest in the world. And when you think about a restaurant at 300, 350, 400 rupees cost on a per square foot basis uh, as the rent, while the average order value is also similar, that's very different as compared to West, where the real estate prices are low, while the average order value that the customer is paying is high. So, uh, you know, these equations are changing. Obviously, cloud kitchens are also helping in that, uh, in helping you expand. But overall, India is really, really underpenetrated. This trend will only go up. And if you are an entrepreneur wanting to start a food business, I think the market is huge. Uh, there is ease of doing business which is improving and uh, you know if you get the basics right which are all in your hand there is no reason why you can't thrive interesting do we have cloud kitchens outside IPL stadiums you guys have I'm sorry cloud kitchens outside IPL stadiums um, so we we are, <laughs> we are actually the official sponsor for uh, RCB so for all the matches of RCB in the IPL, we are setting up, uh, you know, the we, we have set up in the Chinnaswamy Stadium. So, you know, next time you're going for a match, you'll see Eat Shore and Behrouz and some of the Oven Story Pizza. With the Oven actually set up, you know, making uh, fresh pizza orders um, at the stadium. But yeah, the, all these use cases are evolving. Quick question before I get, get with a couple of questions. Cloud kitchens for physical, what's your take? Cloud kitchens for physical business. Cloud or uh, brick and mortar? Yeah, see, again, I would say it's individual decision, right? If you think about, if, if you are passionate about Korean cuisine and you think that the average order value is going to be upwards of 2000, you know, the total addressable market might be very less because not many people may, may be looking for Korean cuisine, but then probably offline is the right model for you. If you want to solve the problem of, uh, you know, daily meals, Customers will probably not pay more than 200 to 50 rupees for a daily meal, right? But you will solve a very big problem which exists. Even right now, we don't have a brand across the country like Domino's is in pizza, which can actually solve for daily meals. We have a brand called Lunchbox and it's, it's doing well, but I don't think, you know, we can say that we've, we've really solved it for the customer. So it starts with what is the problem you want to solve? The need for Korean food in the market or the need that the daily meals need? If it's daily meals, you have to be present in many locations. That means you have to make it a cloud specific, uh, you know, format and solve accordingly. So the question of cloud versus offline really depends on what is the cuisine that you are passionate about and what is the problem you are trying to solve for the customer. Yes, over to you. Mics, please. Yeah. Quick questions, please. Hi, uh, my name is Arun Namani. I'm with Rakana Energy. Um, my takeaway from this conversation, and I'll summarize it in two seconds, then I have a question, is that the, the really nature of this business is operational excellence, that how well you run your operations. And the markers that I picked of these, this excellence is things like SOP compliance, safety, asset health, uh, resource utilization, etc. 
So if you look at this whole paradigm of these parameters in achieving that operational excellence, at what point of a kitchen's evolution should they start thinking about introducing technology to manage this operational excellence and improve their operational infrastructure? Specifically to anybody or? Uh, just an open question. Have you guys adopted technology or? Uh, yes, I think uh, with, with technology, I think you need to adapt at the earlier stage. Today, uh, I had a meeting in the morning with an AR uh, team you know, where they're helping you trace, track and trace what is being produced and what is being consumed. So uh, to achieve operational excellence in the beginning itself, you need to have technology integrated from your order taking to managing your inventories to uh, production to sales to upselling to customer reviews everything is integrated so i think without technology you will not be able to achieve operational excellence in today's standards but how how big or small do you need to be to start that process to get on that journey uh, i think uh, if you're big you definitely have to uh, have technology if you're small you can start really small with technology from a basic point of sale where you can have handheld machines or phones take your order to managing inventory you know whether you're small or big you need to start technology at a very early stage if you're big you definitely need to start since we are times up and the competitors asked us to wind up thanks a lot pleasure speaking to all of you and thanks for the wonderful audience to hearing us a lot of takeaways i presume and all the very best <laughs>